uh, and it has to go back to uh, World War II when this relationship was uh, established or, or changed so substantially that it became something new. Because at the end of World War II, um, there was a general perception that uh, science had won the war. Strange men, and they were mostly men, guys in white jackets, um, eggheads they were called at the time, had come up with um, penicillin, radar, and then the atomic bomb as the punctuation point. And, and, and it, almost as if magicians pulling rabbits out of their hats uh, enabled the uh, allied forces to win the war. And in that process, a, a man named Vannevar Bush had uh, organized basic scientific research as part of the war effort. Before that, it had been mostly um, small university science departments and um, a, a few companies doing scientific research. But uh, by the time the war was over, it had become a national priority. And it was funded by the government to do basic research. And so the scientists were the same way that you would have civilian control of the military, you would have civilian control of science, because the two were, at that point, intermixed in people's minds as being two parts of the same thing. So uh, when uh, Vannevar Bush organized the National Science Foundation and a bill was written in Congress and brought along to President Truman to sign to found NSF, he uh, vetoed it because at that point the board that uh, ran NSF was entirely determined by scientists themselves. And it was considered to be a little bit scary at that moment to give scientists control of the NSF and therefore in control of basic research. Who knows what they would do? Maybe they would take over. And so Truman rejected the bill, vetoed it, came back where the president now gets to appoint half of the um, members of the NSF board. And at that point, Truman signed it. And this is just one small sign of the relationship. And the deal at that point was that um, Scientists would be given money by NSF. They would choose themselves their research topics, and then they would provide society with the goods, with the necessities, with the toys, with the medicines, with the, the improvements in life that made um, the post-war period so much different than the pre-war period, which most people remembered as being a time of deprivation and, and uncertainty because of the Depression and then the war itself. So the deal is this, that science discovers what um, the natural world can do and suggests what humans can do to manipulate the natural world for human good. And then the, the decisions of what to do with scientific discoveries would be made by society at large, by the political process, not by scientists themselves. And, and the decisions would be based on other things than scientific considerations, be based on things like ethics or religious values, or political policies made in the political arena, or essentially philosophical decisions that society would make to do, and not scientists themselves deciding what to do. And this was all in the context of a Keynesian economy in which uh, business and government were seen as two parts of a larger whole, and that they worked together, and that one side of this dichotomy, and when it was suffering, the other side would pitch in. And this was uh, the way that Keynes had theorized the way out of the uh, Great Depression. And, and then that confu got confused with the war effort itself. But certainly for what the French called the Glorious 30, the 30 years following World War II of, of um, incredible economic growth around the world, that was a Keynesian arrangement of uh, balance between government and business with both sides seen as being important. And then some things happened. Around 1980, uh, with the Reagan-Thatcher elections and the rise of a monetary um, uh, economic system that disparaged government as being an impediment to the proper operations of the, of the society, um, and also the end of the Soviet Union, we got what people call the neoliberal turn, and we now live in a neoliberal economy, where really it's the market that decides. And government is sort of in the way, and, and it, the, the more it's swept out of the way, the better uh, things will go for the economy, and that immediately equates to humanity itself. In other words, if the economy is doing well, humanity is doing well. 
that's what we've been living in for about the, um, since 1980 or so, and we're still in that. But um, at that point, we no longer had government deciding what we do, just the market deciding. But the problem is, it's become pretty clear that the market actually underprices everything. So it isn't just that there are market failures, as you would say, um, the president of the World Bank said we need to put a price on carbon, which was a remarkable thing for a free market uh, institution like World Bank to have said to the world. But it isn't just that there are market failures, but that the market itself is a failure at properly pricing things. What happens is um, there's buyers and sellers, and together they make a, what economists call a cumulative equilibrium. Supply-demand, the price comes out. It's an index that um, puts a single number on a whole bunch of factors that have come together into the price of something. But the problem is that buyers want to buy things as cheaply as possible, and sellers want to stay in business. So in the competition between sellers to provide goods and services as cheaply as possible to stay in business and attract the buyers, who are many of them desperate and going to buy the cheapest versions of whatever the things are, you get prices that go lower than the real costs of making them. So um, when that happens, you get uh, damage done, uh, real costs, such as waste products and the, the kind of um, uh, what, what economists would call externalities, but they aren't external. The system is one biosphere that we're all in, and as you all know better than anyone else, the finite system, and in that system, if pricing for things is lower than the true costs, those true costs still get paid. They get paid by future generations, and they get paid by the environment, by the rest of the biosphere. Uh, damage is done that um, in classical economics or neoliberal economics says, well, future generations will pay for that, or the environment will cure itself. But at a certain point, it's no longer true, and the damage becomes irreparable. But everything suffers. Uh, labor means people suffer. Environment means the biosphere suffers, and the biosphere is really our extended body, and so um, when the biosphere suffers, we're suffering again. All to make uh, quarterly profits and shareholder value, which again is, uh, these are indexes, they're single rubrics by which you determine whether the uh, human society is doing good or, good or poorly, and, and this is a uh, um, insufficient uh, index number to rate what's really happening if you include the future, which is indeed going to come. So into that situation, the scientific community discovered climate change. And this was a not entirely new discovery, but it was being confirmed by more and more findings. It was becoming essentially a kind of paradigm shift uh, into a new understanding of what was going on. And this is a scientific discovery. In other words, an individual cannot sense by their own individual experiences climate change per se. It takes data, it takes uh, the correlation of, of, of data gathering, and it takes a paradigm that all of the various factoids involved in the, um, the evidence that we find around the globe to say for sure, yes, the climate is warming up, we're getting wilder weather, and it's due to the CO2 that we ourselves have released into the atmosphere by way of burning of fossil fuels. For the scientific community, the case has been closed, substantially closed, except for some outliers that we always have in any human community. But it's been closed now for 20 to 25 years. And it was announced to the world um, as being a new thing. And there was no particular response to this. The, the 1995, the wavings of the hand from the scientists at the back of the room in this particular arrangement of science and society, it didn't cause um, any, any response. And um, this, I think, was a big shock to the scientific community. I think it was felt by many working scientists that as soon as society knew the nature of the danger, that things would change. And when they didn't change, it was like, oh my god. What does this mean? I didn't know that we could be that irrational. This kind of a response out of the, out of the scientific community. And that's the moment that we get the um, 
as a second wave response, and I want to talk about this more, of what, do, what has the scientific community been doing since that realization that announcing of climate change wasn't enough, one of the things that happened was the invention of the term the Anthropocene. So this is a, I want to briefly talk about periodization in history, because I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, my old teacher, Fred Jameson, says we cannot not periodize. So when you think about the past, it's never a flux. It's always been divided up into periods of a sort. In China, it would be dynasties, imperial dynasties, or in uh, feudal England, the kings as they came along, the Victorian period, the Edwardian period. This is a system of periodization. We always do it. And what's interesting is you realize that quickly that it's not a matter of centuries. When you say the 19th century, people began to say, oh, but you know, that really lasted till the World War I. So the 19th century goes till 1914. Those of us who were alive in the 60s, we think to ourselves, well, the 60s really didn't begin in 1960. They began when Kennedy was shot, or when I went to college, or, or when uh, Berkeley blew up in 66. That's when the 60s really began, and the 60s actually ran till 73, the end of the Vietnam War, or 76, when Carter was elected. These names that we have are for periods that we don't um, tag by actual chronological dates, but by changes in history itself. And so a theory of history is revealed when you talk about periods. So um, if you believe that the change of the emperors is the important thing, that's the great man theory, that's a dynastic theory. If you think that it happens because of social movements, then you have something like Marx's periodization of the ancient empires followed by feudalism, followed by capitalism. And then you can indeed project periods into the future. This is a science fiction exercise. You can say what will come next, but that always remains um, provisional and speculative and is a science fiction exercise. So one periodization that was very influential was to say that we were in a period of, in the arts of realism and then modernism and then postmodernism with realism being kind of 19th century Balzac and George Eliot and Dickens and uh, modernism being modernism, the, the, the impressionist painters and Picasso and James Joyce and postmodernism being something that seemed to happen around the same time as the neoliberal turn of 1980. Uh, so we have the postmodern period and there are um, uh, many historians that would try to uh, connect that periodization scheme to its economic base. So um, uh, Giovanni Arrighi would say that first uh, the world, uh, in terms of capitalist history, that the world was controlled uh, marginally as a new thing by Genoa, then by Holland, then by Britain, and then by the U.S. And Arrighi was speculating would China be next when he had a, a premature death. But when he was wondering was, is there any more room for China to do what the earlier world empires had done? There's another theorist, Jason Moore, who talks about um, the four cheaps, that history is, um, and especially of capitalism in that period, since the early modern period, has been progressing in leaps and bounds as new cheaps were discovered. Cheap land, that would be colonialism. Uh, cheap people, that would be slavery. Cheap food, it would be like the sugar revolution of the 18th century or the green revolution of the 1960s, a sudden infusion of cheap food and cheap energy. And there you have um, first forests, and then peat bogs, then coal, then oil. So you have, a, and there's a lot of fossil carbon in the, in the cheap fuels. And what Moore has been arguing is similar to Arrighi that the world has no more cheaps in it, that we've hit a limit and the ability to uh, make a, a healthy profit, if that's again your rubric, which in capitalism it is, that the ability to make a healthy profit runs out as, you, as the biosphere maxes out in various ways. So what's interesting to me is the Anthropocene is in strange ways saying the same thing as these human historians, even though its methodology is entirely and completely different the uh, International Commission on Stratigraphy, 
bunch of geologists, a division of the AGU, I think, or it might be international. They get together and they look at evidence from the past, and as you may know, they divided up um, the history of the Earth's, the Earth's history into periods also. There's eons, and we're in the Phariseoic eon. There's only two of, of eons. And, and there's eras that are subdivision. We're in the Cenozoic era. And there's periods. We're in the Quaternary period. And there's epochs. And we are in the, we were in the Holocene epoch, a subdivision uh, of the Quaternary that began about 2.5 million years ago. And most um, epochs la seem to last about 20 to 40 million years in the division scheme of the geologists. So um, a Paul Crutzen climatologist picked up a, a word from the 1980s of an earlier scientist and said, you know what, we're now in the Anthropocene. And I feel that this was indeed, as I was saying before, a scientific response to trying to wake up the society to the dangers of climate change by naming the whole geological period after us. The impact of human beings on Earth's biosphere is bigger than any other impact. And it, what's I like about this attempt to name the Anthropocene because of the geology aspect of it is it's a kind of a science fiction story. And what it's saying is, if you go 50 million years out in the future and you look back at Earth's history from that time, you're gonna see a mark in the geological record that will mark that something happened that is, we know as human beings, 50 million years from now, they might not even know what it is. They might not be able to explain it, but they will say something happened here. The level of radiation from the nuclear tests, the amount of plastic, if plastic really doesn't degrade, which I actually think over 50 million, 50 million years ago, maybe it does. Uh, but most significantly, a mass extinction events. So there's been five mass extinction events in uh, in the Earth's history, and some of them have been huge, the Permian in particular, and the last one, 65 million years ago, famously, the end of the dinosaurs, the KT boundary, probably uh, an asteroid impact down in, in the Yucatan. So we have a, a, a way of marking geological periods that is, for the geologists, quite distinct, and 50 million years from now, if they look back this time and they see that um, most of the mammals died within a 200, 300 year period, something had to have happened. And maybe they'll be able to tag us as a cause, maybe not. But what's interesting about this is that you can't decide. The, the, the thing that makes it clear to me that this is a political intervention and a, and a waving of a flag to get people's attention rather than a a serious attempt at stratigraphy, is the mass extinction event hasn't happened yet. So um, what Crutzen and others who are using the name Anthropocene are trying to say is, we are in danger of creating a new geological period that will be a disaster for Earth's biosphere by this new name. And you can imagine that you, um, by our behavior in the next couple of centuries, we could dodge the Anthropocene entirely, and it would have to be canceled or called off. Oh, we're not in an Anthropocene at all, because there hasn't been a mass extinction event, and 50 million years from now, you're not going to be able to tell that we arrived on this planet. Or, alternatively, you could make a good Anthropocene so that future geologists might indeed be able to tag the moment when humans were the major force of change on this planet's biosphere, but that it was in a good way, or that at least it wasn't uh, connected with a mass extinction event. So that's why this today's talk, I talk about imagining um, the creation of a good Anthropocene. We are at a very peculiar moment in human history, and now I think the case has been made in the biosphere's history because of our impact on it, where on the one hand, if we do uh, cook the planet with climate change and go up to four, five, six degrees Celsius um, global average rise, which is possible the way that we're behaving now, then um, you do get a mass extinction event for sure, and human civilization will be um, so damaged by that mass extinction event that you can imagine wars, famines, and a spectacular drop in the human population and uh, immiseration of those that remain, a kind of a new dark ages. It's, it's hard to emphasize how bad the bad Anthropocene can be, 
uh, because we're just not used to imagining disaster on this level. And the repeated dystopias in popular culture, although they're usually about human politics, I think underlying it is this sense of biosphere danger that we're in. On the other hand, because of the power of science and um, our abilities as social primates to get along with each other, which are remarkable even though um, extremely fractious and, and uh, bad things happen, but the idea that there are eight billion people on this planet at any one time managing to cooperate as much as we do is a, is a success story of a social primate species. So that you can imagine a good Anthropocene could happen and it could be really good. Uh, maybe even getting better as we go along and get better at it. And what would I mean by that would be um, adequacy for all. So uh, the carrying capacity of this planet for humans is a, a vexed topic. Uh, social scientists and ecologists can't do it because some in humans, like us, use 30 times more of the Earth's resources than the poorest people on the planet. So carrying capacity can't work like it can on an island in the Great Lakes where you've got wolves and, m and moose and like that. Um, nevertheless, when you're trying to decide how to go forward, you gotta take the number you have. So in terms of a good Anthropocene, you gotta say eight to 10 billion people, all of them at adequacy, all of them with food, water, shelter, clothing, healthcare, education, meaningful work. That's part of a good Anthropocene. And then all the rest of the mammals, including the wild mammals, and our domestic beasts. But the wild mammals are going away, and um, also the birds, the amphibians, and, and the fish under our impact. So a good Anthropocene would include a space for them. They also would be at adequacy and would be part of a living biosphere. They're part of our extended body. They're our cousins. They're our horizontal brothers and sisters. Uh, they have to be part of the story, or the story isn't a success story. It isn't a good Anthropocene without the rest of the biosphere doing well as well. So is that possible? Well, um, the, the physicists, the ecologists, the chemists say, well, it's marginally possible now. Um, it's, a, it's a closing window of opportunity, but if we were to do everything right starting now, you can imagine that it kind of would happen. And one thing that might happen in a good Anthropocene is that um, the human population might begin to drop naturally just because when people are prosperous, the replacement rate is 2.2 kids per woman. That drops below, down to below 2.2 uh, kids per woman whenever people are living uh, prosperous lifestyles. So you can imagine a, a, a non-catastrophic and ja gradual drop in the human population down to a number that might stress the rest of the biosphere less than it does now. So. The term Anthropocene, I have to say, has in the, I think it's 15 years since it was first introduced, has become nothing but a pinball in the academic machinery. Uh, if, the, if you think of academia, uh, especially the humanities and social science departments that some of you might not be as familiar with as I am, but they love this term, but they also love it the way that football players love a football or the way pinball players love a pinball. You knock it around, you talk about it. When did it actually begin? What does it actually mean? The argumentation, the papers, the books, it's been, there's already been an infinity of discourse and the, the flag waving of the, the original intent of the term Anthropocene has by and large been lost. It's just one more word in a sea of words and in a roar of discourse, the idea that humans are the dominant force on Earth for urban populations that never see wild animals anyway and think that their food comes from the grocery stores, it's like, big deal, we already knew that. So it hasn't been the kind of, uh, it doesn't seem to have been the kind of uh, political uh, smack in the face that it was meant to be by its inventors in the scientific community. But sometimes things happen in subterranean ways. There's a kind of a mass uh, unconscious. Uh, there's, we all have an individual unconscious, and there's also a kind of a mass unconscious of all of us acting together. And I want to say, we had the Paris Agreement, the Paris Accords, the Paris Agreement 2015. If you have been paying attention, which all, ever, all of us have, these last, say, 20 years, I find the Paris Ac Agreement to have been stupendously surprising. If you had said in 1995 
all the nations on Earth, their governments will agree to cut, uh, to cut the use of, of carbon fuels for transport, energy, and agriculture, I would have said no way. But it happened. Why did it happen? Because the scientific community has been getting the message through. And there is resistance to change because the fossil fuel industry, among many other parts, first of all, people want to travel, they need electricity, electricity is a health aid, and they want to travel, and they like to eat, they need to eat. So uh, we have a technological base that burns carbon for all these things. So it's, it's inconvenient indeed to be told that the basis of your entire uh, uh, life way is in wrecking the biosphere. So there is that kind of resistance. But there's also $2 billion been spent by the fossil fuels industry to influence legislation. And there, uh, you have to say that um, the, the uh, organized fight to keep burning fossil fuels has been a dangerous fact. Nevertheless, the Paris Accord, and it is uh, relatively toothless, but everything has to begin somewhere. And another science fiction uh, uh, exercise I would invite you to take is that um, if pe anyone is around to write the history of the human race, a, a world history, which there's a bit written all the time right now. Sometimes it's called big history, and it goes right back to the Big Bang. Sometimes it's just called world history, and it starts more or less with the Paleolithic. In those histories, if someone's writing one five or 10,000 years from now, the Paris Agreement will be uh, mentioned. It'll get a page, a paragraph, it might even get a chapter, because it'll be that moment when the human community recognized that we're one global civilization with one global economic system. We're wrecking the planet. We have to change. And so it's important. Now, after that, and, in, and pretty much now, coming back to the present, you have a situation where I call it now the technocratic push. So it's the kind of work that you all are doing in your various ways to influence the laws. So the old um, post-war agreement that scientists do science and then um, the society sets the laws and the economic system by way of the political process, it no longer works and the scientific community having realized that they're engaged in what I call the technocratic push. And Every time I say science, I'm, I'm, I should add parenthetically, I hope you know this, I mean STEM. I mean science, technology, engineering, and medicine. Not mathematics, but medicine. That these are all involved in the, 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 the technocratic push means that scientists in their official capacities as scientists are beginning to try to change the laws. So government becomes not the thing that the market gets to push to the side, but a site of contestation, because even a free market economy is actually a system of laws, and laws change all the time in a political process. So if you change bad laws to good laws, you could change bad results to good results. And so government becomes the site of contestation, neither friend nor enemy, but actually the site where all of this gets argued over. And this is where politics happens. This is where we have fights over policy. So this latest IPCC report, for instance, is a, a part of the tech, technocratic push. It's a way of saying, this is what we know now. This is what we have to do. The latest one was, was another attempt at a big slap in the face. We have 20 years left. It was quite a, 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 a you might say, a doom-filled uh, report the latest IPCC report. But, uh, but these are at the international level, treaties, UN statements, the attempt to grapple with the idea that it's a global problem that needs a global solution. But there's also thousands of efforts at smaller levels, at the individual level of one watershed or one law or one locality. And even here, what I think it has to be understood is that the people making the laws, the elected legislatures and their paid staffs, they need advice and guidance. Okay, we want to do the right thing. What is the right thing? And this is what I'm calling the technocratic push. The scientific community is saying this is the right thing. And there's a problem, and we, I noticed that you've had many meetings about science communication, 
That's good. It is uh, crucially important. Um, one way it can be conceptualized is as a matter of translation. Things have to be translated from scientific terms, ranging from data sets to equations to um, uh, models and paradigms into legal terms, which is to say laws. And that act of translation is not straightforward or simple. Um, I, I recently got to meet with people at the, the UC, um, all of the UC water divisions, all of the various departments of the University of California that are studying water issues got together with the California State Water Board. Um, and they got together to talk about, well, what laws could work a few years ago in California, they passed the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, SIGMA, 2014, great law. But how to implement it? And what does it mean at the detail level? And what should the numbers be? And how should it be reported? And all of this is something that the people who wrote the law, which had to be a general law to get past it all, there had to be some vague spots. What in science fiction we call the strategic opacity Whenever you're in, in science fiction, you have to write down what the genius physicist of the year 2500 said. You have a strategic opacity, like a fig leaf, that actually covers that statement with, well, he said it, and it was great, and then you move on from there. Well, laws get passed like that. And then you have to fill in the detail. You don't get to have strategic opacities once you get to the, um, the, uh, the, uh, where the, the, the statement of the law meets the practice of the people out in the field. So in California, it's pretty interesting. The Central Valley has its groundwater has been depleted, and um, it is a stupendous reservoir. The Central Valley of California, where we are right now, it's actually 40,000 feet down to bedrock, which I had our late and much lamented uh, friend, Eldridge Moores, who died last week, by accident, um, he explained to me five times, because I kept not believing it, that it was 40,000 feet down, something like eight miles down before you hit bedrock. That's a lot of dirt. It's kind of remarkable, but it's true. And uh, it fills up with water, and of course you can't pump to the bottom of it, but you do need it topped up to the top for us to be able to pump that groundwater. And this is what the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act is about. It's taking the groundwater of the Central Valley of California from an individual private property that anybody can use in any way they want to a managed commons. And really, this is a kind of a small scale example of something that's going to have to happen everywhere in the world. The idea that any individual could do what they want with their private property is indeed an idea out of the neoliberal moment of capitalist history. The idea of the commons, that we have a shared resource that everybody needs and everybody gets to use, but that you use it sustainably, a managed commons, and commons were always managed. They were never free-for-alls. They were never, everybody got to do what they wanted. They were not regulated, but they were managed by a system of norms. Now they need to be spelled out in laws, because that's the kind of world we live in. But returning the world to the commons is a, is a legal move, as, as well as a, a kind of an ethical and moral move. So when legislative staffs and elected officials, they say, what should we do? Then you say, well, ecologically, you should do this. And then you have to translate it to legally, you need to say that. Um, and the results, I, I'm, again, I'll go to California as an example. There, it turns out that the, that the Central Valley floor is not uh, equally permeable or impermeable everywhere. Uh, if, there's going to be floods. The Sierra Nevadas are, are going to, uh, we have a snowpack up there, and you get like um, 14, you get something like 14 million acre feet of water a year that lands as snow on the Sierras. But in climate change, that's already certain to happen, a lot of that more is, is going to be rain. The, the um, Reservoirs on the surface in California can hold about 40 million acre feet, all of them put together. And the uh, Central Valley groundwater basin holds about a million acre feet. So that's the obvious reservoir is to get water in there. But in f when floods come, they tend to run out onto the plain, tear everything apart. Uh, a neighborhood called Natomas will go under. Uh, and be mass human devastation, and then it flows out the Golden Gate and it doesn't get saved like the snowpack would have been saved. So uh, current plan in terms of groundwater recharge 
is to trap that water on its way out in the places where the Sencha Valley is more permeable than others. And what I love as a Sierra person is that those permeable places are fossil canyons from the end of the Ice Age, when water was running off the Sierras so um, uh, vigorously that incised canyons were cut in the Central Valley floor that are up to 300 feet deep and up to a couple miles wide. They've since filled in with glacial rubble and with dirt, but that glacial rubble is so much more permeable than dirt proper that if you can trap the water over these fossil riverbeds of the end of the Ice Age, it will sink back into the groundwater much more quickly than if you had it elsewhere. So the Central Valley begins to act like a sponge in this uh, managed reorganization of life on the valley floor, which has been just an industrial a factory site, uh, an outdoor industrial factory for food for the last hundred years. You have to give up some of that to make it into a sponge. You get a return, if you do it, of the oak forests around the rim of the Central Valley as carbon drawdown. You get regenerated, regenerative agriculture in which, as you do agriculture, you, act, you suck carbon down rather than expend carbon. Uh, agriculture has to be kind of reinvented for that purpose. And you also get rewilding. You essentially get habitat for wild animals. And the Central Valley of California has been called before uh, Europeans arrived, the Serengeti of North America for the amount of biomass that lived on this valley floor that is no longer here, is absolutely gone. I can uh, say that as a witness to it these last 30 years, having seen nothing but rabbits and uh, snakes and, the occasion, and, of course, a fair population of birds, but not the same. So in an integrated and managed uh, good Anthropocene, you get um, multiplying values across the board so that you get a place that not only will keep us at adequacy in a sustainable way over the long haul, but this balance with the biosphere begins to create a, a kind of utopian space, a, a beautiful space. Uh, it will be human, not human created, but human managed and inflected. Uh, the way that environmental artists will take stuff out of the environment and make something beautiful out of it, that will be what civilization would be doing with um, its efforts on behalf of survival itself and avoiding the climate change problem. So, um, in terms of the scientific community, institutions like yours getting more votes from the general populace because the technocratic push it can't really work in an anti-democratic way, in fact, I think what we're seeing in the, in the violent reactions against um, technocratic elites trying to manage society without democratic understanding and input, you get the nationalist uh, blowback. You get the, the angry, uh, destructive attempt to go back to some imagined past that never really existed. So in other words, although I love the technocratic push and I feel that it is our best chance at survival, it needs to communicate itself as such to everybody so that you actually get the votes and you have the legislators with the will to do what you're suggesting to them to do. That gets back to the things that you were talking in your other, um, in your other uh, conferences on scientific communication. And I, I, I don't have a whole lot that I want to venture to say on that because I believe that it's a topic that others know more about than I do. Um, in, uh, every scientist is an ambassador for science. Um, that's true. But I've also noticed that almost every working scientist already has like 26 hours of things to do in every 24-hour period. And it's like if I say, well, you also got to add 20% of your time to going out and doing public outreach. Uh, it's a nice idea, but very, very difficult to enact. But everybody can be an ambassador in their own way, uh, to speak for science just as an ordinary citizen in the rest of your lives in civil society. If you have time for school boards, uh, church groups, guided expeditions, visits to elementary schools and all that, it's great, and it should be done, but it's, uh, it strikes me that it's hard to tack on to what um, you're already doing. And so it'd be an interesting thing at scientific conferences to talk about time management in the life of a scientist. How can you carve more time 
uh, for, for becoming an ambassador for science. And then, you know, visualization, metaphors, analogies, I think all of this is relatively obvious, that you can't give them the equations, you can't drop your 5,000 pages of data on their laps uh, to explain what's going on to somebody who's interested but not got the expertise that you have. So the, the image of you can't turn an oil tanker in any less than 10 miles, it takes time and you have to get a start on it and you have to be patient. The image of the boiling frog, that the frog's in the water, it seems fine, it's getting hot at a slow rate, and the frog doesn't realize that a point's gonna come. Uh, fouling your nest, an old image that people used to think made perfect sense. If you think now that the world is the nest and humanity doesn't have any other planets to go to, which I can attest to personally, um, uh, these images, these phrases, they have an unexpected power, and there must be many more of them. And I guess lastly I'd say consilience. This is an E.O. Wilson word, that all of the sciences support each other, and that they are all interconnected, that the physics is at the bottom of it, then chemistry, then biology, then you get into ecology, and then you get into the social sciences, and you even get into human psychology. The more you get along, the spookier and less certain it gets because the ordinary scientific method is not good at studying you know, human societies or human minds. Not because it's any fault of the scientific method, it's just that what that method is good at doesn't work when you have huge numbers of multivariant factors and experiments that can't be done because they're unethical. So the scientific method can be applied to all these, uh, all fields, but it has uh, value in some more than others. Nevertheless, it's conciliant across the board. And if you're ever in a discussion where you think you can actually persuade someone, and you have to admit, these are rare occasions, but when they happen, if you could remind people that um, when they are sick and scared for their lives, they go to a scientist, which is to say their doctor that medicine is a science and that everything that people take to keep themselves healthy that they run to, by and large, in our society is in fact a scientific result and a scientific experiment being run on them. Well, this is a great learning experience because on the one hand, you realize that when you are scared for your life, you go to a scientist. On the other hand, that scientist may tell you, oops, sorry, you're doomed, I can't fix you. So science is not magic. And this is another important lesson for people to learn. So, um, one last point, economics, that's not a science. That is a quantitative analysis of a legal system. It's like quantified ethics. Its axioms are not physical truths. They are legal arrangements we've made amongst ourselves. So it irritates me when there's a Nobel Prize for uh, physics and for medicine and for chemistry, and, uh, and then there's a Nobel Prize for economics. Well, that wasn't Alfred, Alfred Albert Nobel. Nobel did not uh, uh, call that one out. The economists of the world somehow managed to buy Norway's name. And so later on, you have a Nobel Prize in economics. The people in culture studies, where I come from, Norway has a Holmberg Prize because in culture studies you didn't have the financial and uh, reputational power to be able to get a Nobel Prize in culture studies. So the Holmberg Prize, nobody knows anything about that. The Nobel Prize in economics, it looks like it's a real Nobel Prize. But economics is not a science in the same way that even sociology is. So even um, people from CTAC, people doing the kind of sciences that you do, could uh, put a spotlight on economics and say, but wait, that doesn't, uh, that's not physics, that doesn't work. If you even were trying to go for what people want out of their lives, it doesn't make sense. It's a power relation. It's a kind of politics of power, and particularly neoliberal capitalism with the 1% and the 99% and uh, 2 billion people on this planet living in misery. This is a power relation, not a science. So I think if the scientific community were to all hammer together on economics and see if some improvements could be made in that field and make it, in fact, more scientific, uh, that that would be a huge help for um, going forward. So this is, I think, my ending. Everything needs to be more scientific, and uh, with that, I'll conclude. <laughs>